So, yeah, I'm well, Iggy. I'm a ex-police officer. I was in the Met Police for 20 years, seven of which was in the cybercrime unit where I developed a knowledge around cryptocurrencies. And as of four weeks ago, I moved over to Coinbase, so I'm very new to the private sector. Um, today, I'll be talking about cryptocurrencies, explaining them to you. And um, if you could leave all the questions at the end, that'd be great. Um, so without further ado, I'll start. Okay, will the mic go a bit louder? Jake, will the mic go a bit louder? Oh, I don't know how to tell the digital. Slow button better. How's that? Any better? Yeah. At the back? Great. So this is a plug for Coinbase, found in 2012. 20 plus million users globally. 150 million, sorry, million dollars of assets traded and a variety of cryptocurrencies available for purchase on our platform. We have several types of products offered. A consumer over-the-counter account that you can join with us. Uh, a, account, a trading account. A prime account for institutions who want to hold or trade cryptocurrencies. Custody, so cryptocurrencies. Uh, a commerce platform where if you want to take payment in uh, cryptocurrencies, So one of the big questions facing uh, regulators is, are cryptocurrencies fiat currency? Fiat when we talk about pounds, shillings, pence, Deutschmark, dollars, etc. I think they are, and that's my own personal opinion, not that of Coinbase or of the regulators or of the police service. So it has certain facets and attributes which are very common in uh, fiat currencies. So it's a common medium of exchange. It's a transferable store of value. It's recognised and interchangeable. One Bitcoin can be interchanged with another Bitcoin. <coughs> it's divisible to what's called a Satoshi, which is 100 million of a Bitcoin. Just like you have pence that make up a pound. It's transportable, it's an electronic ledger, it's data. And it's secure and very <coughs> difficult to counterfeit. That's the Bitcoin address. A very long series of numbers and letters, usually starting with a one or a three, sometimes a lowercase b. This is the signifier for a store of assets, a store of Bitcoin. This is what's recording what's known as the distributed ledger or the blockchain. And it is the only identifying information for a transaction. There are no names, no email addresses, no telephone numbers that are also replicated on the blockchain. That is all you've got as an investigator. So, distributed ledger technology. Think of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as a series of ledgers. You have your own personal ledger, just like in the old days of accounting, where you record your credits and debits. All of those transactions are replicated in a worldwide ledger of every single transaction that's taken place in Bitcoin since its inception and the first transaction was made in 2009. The miners. Miners act as a form of ledger keepers ensuring that all transactions are formatted correctly and that you have the Bitcoin that you say you have. Satoshi Nakamoto, no one knows who they are, he or she. They published the Bitcoin protocol in 2008, the first transaction went live in 2009. They're also very rich, they've got a large stash of crypto. There will only ever be 21 million uh, Bitcoins in circulation and that will happen in the year 2140. And that is a rule that's written into the uh, Bitcoin protocol. And there's no regulation as yet. So uh, there is talk that it will be subject to what's called uh, anti-money laundering directives from the EU 
and that some versions of cryptocurrencies will be regulated and the blockchain a series of thousands of computers servers hosted in various different locations around the world not under the control of one entity which stores a copy of every single transaction made in the block in Bitcoin so that's thousands of records of those transactions every single transaction they also act as a way of relaying the Bitcoin transactions through the system so before we begin has anyone actually got any crypto hands up you okay this is Bob that's Alex Bob wants to send Alex some Bitcoin say one one Bitcoin he acts as his ledger of cryptocurrency. He creates a transaction which he signs with his private key, or for another uh, <coughs> phrase, his password. He writes a message to tell the Bitcoin network that he wants to send Alex one Bitcoin. Alex is also, it knows that she's going to be getting her Bitcoin from Bob and accesses her ledger as well through what's called wallet software. Wallet software stores the credentials necessary to interact with your store of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. Okay, that's a Bitcoin just saw one earlier. That's another one and we have the private key there. A very long series of digits and numbers. So you wouldn't be able to remember them. That's why you have wallet software. It stores those credentials for you. Is it worth me taking a photo of that or is that an empty? Go for it if you want. It's not mine. <laughs> and to remove the barriers for use of it, we have QR codes so you can import those uh, public and private keys. So we've got software wallets, store the credentials on the device, tablet, phone, laptop. Online services, online wallets like uh, blockchain.com or Coinbase but they also offer another function which is that to buy and sell cryptocurrencies so not only can you store them with blockchain.com you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies through them as well then we have physical wallets, hardware devices like trezors or uh, ledger keys which store those credentials behind uh, quite high encryption and also paper bitcoin wallets where you can replicate those details your public and private key for your store of bitcoin Other people also want to send some Bitcoin as well. So they transmit their messages saying who they want to send their Bitcoin to. That's ingested by the nearest Bitcoin node. It might be geographical. It might be the one with the best bandwidth. And then it propagates those messages throughout the network so that within 10 minutes, all of the Bitcoin nodes in the network have received those transactions. Every 10 minutes, all of those transactions that haven't been um, reviewed by the miners are put into a box, a metaphorical box. Mining groups exist in order to validate the transactions, check you have the bitcoins that you say you have, but they have to do this for some reason. There has to be an incentive. And that incentive is not only earning the fee, but they have to solve a puzzle. Solving a puzzle means that they win the prize, and that prize is quite lucrative. The miners ingest all of those transactions that have occurred in the last 10 minutes, review them, ensuring that they're formatted correctly and that you have the Bitcoin that you say you do. This is what mining looked like in 2009. Graphic cards, GPUs, sticks together, and that's what it looks like now. Industrial um, enterprises in countries where electricity and cooling is cheap because all these rapid computers generate a lot of heat. The protocol will adjust the difficulty of that puzzle to ensure that transactions are checked every 10 minutes and each block is corrected every 10 minutes. So 
third is a, a group a group Why it's so lucrative. Having ingested that proof of work, the solution to the puzzle, and those transactions that occurred in the last 10 minutes that have been validated and checked, it propagates it again across the Bitcoin node. So those ledgers of all transactions are updated to the latest set of transactions. That block of transactions happened in those last 10 minutes is independent to the previous block. And Bob's transaction lies within it. Alice is reviewing the blockchain, with blockchain.com. Sees the transactions being confirmed and appears in the last block. I know that she now has the Bitcoin within her wallet. <coughs> And that's why it's given the name the blockchain. Chain to block the transaction, linked together cryptographically. That's blockchain.com, that's where you can review all transactions, blocks that have been mined. That one was mined uh, so it's 15 minutes ago, given a block number, the number of transactions within it, and who mined it as well. That's default. Each transaction Point. But he wants to do it in such a way as to know and know that he sent it. Other people do as well. He sends his Bitcoin transaction to bitblender.io, as do a number of other people. What the service will do, it will break up that amount of Bitcoin into smaller amounts. It will then break up everyone else's Bitcoin in small amounts and send it through a number of different Bitcoin uh, transactions in varying amounts, varying times. In doing so, creating hundreds of transactions. Gives it a shape, and eventually Alice receives her one Bitcoin. As does everyone else. Because it's created so many transactions, in a very short space of time, in varying amounts, you cannot tell how much is sent initially and how much is received.
crypto casinos, online, crypto only, betting establishment, very simple games, dice games, card games, etc. You might if you think back to dice game cash for bank robberies, criminals would take the cash which was stained with dice and go into betting shops and go to fixed odds betting terminals. Plug in the dirty cash which is stained with uh, paint, make a small bet and take the coins out. That's cleaning money, that's laundering. That's exactly what happened here. It's breaking the chain of transaction. Deposit your funds there, make a small bet and withdraw to a clean address. <coughs> they are global. They have very low barriers for you to sign up. Password, email address, sometimes none at all. Exchanges. Exchanges just like banks are susceptible to money laundering. People will set up fake accounts. It happens all the time. People will use exchanges to break the chain. Deposit it, the coins there and then withdraw to a clean address. Firewalk deals not only in cryptocurrencies but also the currencies in virtual worlds such as uh, Linden Dollars and World of Warcraft. So if you're going to Second Life, having exchanged your Bitcoin for Linden Dollars, purchase something online, sell it to someone else, and thereby conduct money laundering, trade-based money laundering within that virtual world. Binance is one of the biggest exchanges out there. A large number of cryptocurrency pairs on offer. It's got an app as well, so it's great. Um, and Kraken, a compliant US exchange with offices in London and America, and we have local Bitcoins, a peer-to-peer -peer Bitcoin exchange. It operates as a platform where buyers and sellers can come together and arrange their own deals and they can either meet in person, hand over cash and receive Bitcoin, or they can do a bank transfer. <coughs> Coin conversion. They so don't operate as an exchange. You simply deposit and get the equivalent in a different coin. So for example, you can deposit in Bitcoin and obtain Monero through Change Early or Shape Chip. This is a peer-to-peer -peer version of that. And again, varying levels of you know, your customer information that are available on each of those platforms. <coughs> then we have crypto visa cards. These are uh, backed by Visa. You deposit your cryptocurrencies with a company, and then when you want to load up your card, you simply exchange in the in app or in company exchange. And you can use it wherever you see a visa sign. Withdraw it from an ATM if you want. Nintendo allows us to deposit in cryptocurrencies as well. We've got Bitcoin ATMs, 105 nationally, 91 in London, four main companies. Uh, there are some anecdotal evidences linked to gang activities. One way or two way machines. So, how do you investigate the blockchain and cryptocurrencies? You need software tools. These are some of the market leaders with software tools, and they operate uh, by analysing open source information, transactional data, the data, the metadata incorporated in the transactions, and making payments. It is extremely time consuming, and it provides an indication as to where a Bitcoin address or who is controlling that Bitcoin address, generally a company, who can then be approached for information. But they are expensive. Exchange providers, the dark market, are all visible in some of these uh, cryptocurrency and these uh, tracking trade tools, as they're called. And it's the main point of weakness because you've got to go back into cash if you want to realise your earnings. Because cash is still king in this society. Trusting provides that ability to do a compliance check. And don't uh, discount if you're dealing with cryptocurrencies any form of compliance, existing measures. Those closed and open sources of information that you can interrogate to see whether or not the person you're dealing with is who they say they are and also their source of funds. This is a free tool called Wallet Explorer. As you can see, it clusters many of the known exchanges as well as the dark markets as well. 
can access it, it is free, and look at transactions. It gives you the identity of who the sender was, in this case, Bistamp, which is an exchange. You can see that someone received 1.7 Bitcoin at an account at Polonia. Alphabay Market, and uh, someone withdrew directly from Alphabay into their Carlton account. It's for law enforcement and investigators, it's pretty stupid. Um, because you can go to Clark and ask for information from them. Who received the cryptocurrency? We have Huobi, Southeast Asian Exchange. Someone sent funds to Bitcoin Fog, which is a mixing service. This is Neutrino, one of the track and trace tools. It looks a lot prettier and provides a graphical interface for you to look at all the transactions and find out where they're clustered to, to allow you to then make those applications. We'll find out more about your customer. <coughs> and this is a transaction going into Alphabay Market, aggregating into <coughs> one Bitcoin address from numerous inputs at local Bitcoin. You see it out to the Bitstamp, then onwards to Alphabay. Some of the cases involving cryptocurrencies, Grant West, Fishing Merchant, South Fishing Site, use Google AdWords, rip people off from credit card details, sold them on dark web. You've got 10 years and he used cryptocurrency to earn his living on Alphabay and other um, startup markets, as well as for paying for services as well, to enable him to commit these crimes. Sorry, police has done the first confiscation, that's a legal order confiscating someone's Bitcoin, that happened last year. So law enforcement is catching up slowly but surely. And we've got the people who hacked the Democratic National Congress in their email account. They use cryptocurrency to pay for their servers in the US. This is all open source. Ransomware, we all know about. Cryptocurrency uses a payment vehicle. Those are my details. Feel free to take them down and I'll take any questions. Did anyone hear that question? No. No. So uh, the question was asked was how did I get into investing in cryptocurrencies? Unfortunately, it was through my job. Um, I had to. I was dealt, uh, given a case which involved cryptocurrencies in 2014, and not many people knew about it. So I educated myself about it by going on YouTube mainly, Google, speaking to the right people, and understanding about it, understanding about track and trace tools, learning how to interpret that information, and also interpret it. For people who don't, do not understand, not only cybercrime, but cryptocurrencies, the main part of my old job was explaining complex um, technologies to a judge, to a jury, uh, which is sometimes <coughs> quite difficult. Try explaining cryptocurrencies to a 60-year-old. <laughs> no offence to 60-year-olds. <laughs> Hello at the back. Uh, I think there's a couple of you asking questions. Um, that's down to the law enforcement to make the right applications to find out where those cryptocurrencies are. There are forensic tools out there that can uh, rip through uh, devices to look for those identifying features of cryptocurrency transactions and those public private keys, recovery keys, etc. There are ways to do it. If it's at an exchange, then most of them are compliant and will respond to a law enforcement request. And for example, uh, take me away from the <coughs> criminal area, what about if someone died, left it in their will, and all their public private keys are gone? Uh, and, but it's held in exchange. So just as you would do with normal wills and probate, the lawyers, the executives of the estate, would then make the necessary applications in civil court and then send them to the exchange. Uh, I think there was another question about it, wasn't there? What, what tools do you use to you know, deal with the investigators and coordinators? So I use open source tools like Wallet Explorer. I'm old school, I like looking at numbers. I'll use Neutrino. I'll use a number of others. Oh, that's it. <coughs> I'll ask you a difficult question just because someone asked you. Um, some people, uh, I guess, 
use banks partially because they'll respect the privacy of their transactions. If you're a celebrity, people might not want to, you might not want people to know that you've checked into rehab or something like that. If you're a large corporation, people, you might not want your competitors to know that you've spent some money on uh, investing in a particular emerging technology that might give you an edge because they might swoop in and make a better offer. Um, I understand and appreciate that what, what you do at Coinbase is you help track people that are using cryptocurrencies for clearly anti-social activities, for criminal enterprises. Um, I wonder, is there, do you feel that there is a tension between uh, enabling people to have privacy um, for the right reasons in their uh, transactions and how they interact with each other economically and at the same time allowing society to track down crime and to, to fight it and to minimise the chances of us uh, suffering from those attackers. There's a balancing act that's in the fiat currency as well with the bank because in order for investigators to make, to get that information for a bank, mm. they've got to make an application of course. Mm. And we are compliant with the laws, even yeah. though we don't need to be. And we have a similar safeguards in place as well. Mm. So if we try and replicate more coin, for instance, Coinbase, the same measures that exist in other areas. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to look at a random Bitcoin address. I'm going to have a cause to do so. Part of my job is to look at the threats to the company, as you, any internal investigator would do, both internal and external. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about reviewing transactions, 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 mm -hmm. reviewing people's activity. It's reviewing them when there is a cause to. Yeah. For example, they receive funds from a fraud. Mm -hmm. They have had their account taken over, right? Who's taken it over? Mm -hmm. So it's not as simple as that. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, no, no, no. no. Just as a follow-up, um, would you? I don't know if Coinbase um, uh, does exchanges with Monero. Monero is kind of it's like Bitcoin, but more anonymous. Would, would you, from the point of view of someone that's involved in know your customer and anti money laundering? Would you consider that to be beyond the pale because it's too easy for people to make untraceable transactions or do you think it's better to work with it and to encourage people that are using it to cooperate so that if they're not doing anything terrible then they can attest to the fact that they're transacting um, what's the word, legitimately if necessary? Or, you know, the I think that comes down to the individual corporation's uh, risk appetite and their you know their customer checks mm -hmm. and how they uh, adopt and how they interact with their customers. Mm -hmm. It's not a, a one size fits all. There may be legitimate reasons using Monero. Mm -hmm. um, it may be within some companies' risk appetite to have Monero as one of their currencies. But again, whether or not Coinbase does it is way above my pay grade. Sure. Um, I've used obviously using Monero, but that's for me testing and using it. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Um, could someone else decide, please? <laughs> Can you hold the mic close to your mouth? It be a lot louder. Could somebody else decide who's going to speak? How easy is it to identify tumbling? So you show a demonstration of tumbling, yeah. like creating transactions with several others. So surely that's quite a difficult thing to be able to distinguish someone who's trying to kind of launder a cryptocurrency from someone who just has a transaction with several others. Yeah, it is difficult, and there are some telltale signs. There are some telltale signs. Um, multiple transactions in a very short space of time. Um, it depends on your experience and having a look at it and understanding it. Sometimes the clustering tools will tell you, um, and as time goes on, my knowledge of it, I'm learning all the time, will improve to, to spot it. Sometimes I've missed it in the past. Hello, at the back. What do you think can be the BTC tools needed to deal with knowledge in these No idea. I have no coding experience whatsoever. Um, sorry, I can't answer that one. <laughs> Hello, at the front. Um, in your investigations, where do you usually start from? For example, you said that Bitcoin was confiscated from a drug dealer. Is that a case of then finding the drug dealer and then finding out he has Bitcoin? Or do most <coughs> investigations start from identifying unusual transactions happening um, with the exchanges? Um, it's a bit of both, really, because uh, when I used to work with cybercrime, cryptocurrency is a, a big feature in any investigation because it's just a thing that's used all the time, except in cybercrime. But it is um, slowly, the rest of the criminal fraternity is taking it on. So the drug dealer was arrested for drug dealing, and through a search, they found the had cryptocurrency holding. So it's a bit of both. And how easy is it to identify an unusual transaction? For example, if you're looking at Coinbase, Presumably, you have to look at the transactions going through the 
company and then identify ones that are high risk, potentially legal, or is that possible? It's no more possible than it is with fiat currency. So with normal banks, what do they do with transaction monitoring systems? Do they look at the context of the transaction? Was there any communication with the customer beforehand? How, what's their history? It's um, not just looking at one thing and in isolation, looking at the entire set of circumstances. Is it something that's out of the ordinary? Or are they just sending a large amount because they're going to go buy, buy something that's quite expensive? Are there any specific slip-ups or mistakes that crypto criminals tend to make that get them caught? And what can they do to avoid that? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Hello? I think you said that with a bit. I was about to say thank you very much for a very wonderful talk. It's really interesting. Um, I was going to ask if you could comment on the differences between investigating uh, fraud and criminal activity with blockchain-based kind of systems as opposed to the traditional way that it's been done in the past with other methods. Is it different? Uh, vastly, and if so, how? It, it's not different at all. You're still following the money, and that's essentially it. With a fraud or money laundering, you are following the money. Where, where it happens with cryptocurrencies, you're still just following the money. It takes a lot longer, and your trail usually leads around the world. Hello, sir. Uh, from your experience, uh, do you see that the currency of crypto not a good way to, to enable you to do the investigation? So you would like something more in uh, the probability of the uh, or Well, I'm not a cop anymore, so I'm. Um, there were laws that we used in order to seize cryptocurrency in the investigation, and they were sufficient. Um, I think what a lot of the cryptocurrency economy and those people in those um, companies want is regulation. And they want a definitive view on what is going to be regulated, what isn't going to be regulated. It's a little bit difficult with Brexit going on in this country, um, which hasn't really focused the minds of regulators. Once those regulations come in, then people will know there is a framework around receiving and sending cryptocurrencies and dealing with customers who want to deal in cryptocurrencies, which may open it up for everyone else um, and then improve their, you know, improve their risk appetite, as it were. But at the moment, because there's no regulation, a lot of companies are saying, no thanks, it's not regulated. Can I have a question? Yeah? No, I was going to say, just going to be the last question. Oh, okay. Um, say you catch a criminal and they've got a uh, they've got bitcoins and you can suspect uh, I know you're not a cop anymore but say you help the police catch a drug dealer um, and they get they know that they've got the bitcoins but it's in a multi signature thing and they don't necessarily know who it's shared with or they're in another another regime will it will it eventually will things become eventually so diffuse that it becomes very difficult to to actually recover those assets or you know it doesn't depend on how savvy the people are. Uh, what their operational security is. So, you know, the analogy I'm thinking is uh, you have these beneficial trusts where in the British Virgin Isles kind of people can get a lot of money and they've got special tax accountants and lawyers and nobody, they don't end up paying a lot of tax. Um, and so could people do the same now digitally where, you know, I, not that I'm into any of that, but I could have a lot of illicit assets and I have a friend in um, Saudi Arabia or in, in a small island somewhere and I make sure that we're multi-sig so it takes two of us to spend, and if, if I go off radar, they make themselves scarce. You know, are there ways around that, or you just have to worry, just to hope that people don't go to that too much effort? I think if you're an investor, you can only do as much as you can, yeah. um, and there are powers and laws and orders that can be made to compel the other person mm -hmm. to restore those funds as part of a criminal, uh, part of a sort of confiscation order. So taking responsibility away from the state, saying, look, you've done as much as you can, mm. you've made enough effort, right, you, you've been convicted, this is your confiscation order, pay up. If you don't pay up, you get another five years in prison. So there are other ways around it. Yeah. You can only do as much as you can. It's all part of a wider incentive structure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, guys.